Yeah, welcome everybody to uh, another edition of our seminar series, Digital and Public Humanities, organized by the Venice Center for Digital and Public Humanities at the Department for Humanities at Kafoska University. And uh, it's a special treat for me today to introduce you to three core members of our team. So that's uh, uh, especially nice uh, to present the research that is being carried out here at our center, uh, the field we are, or especially the three scholars are developing here at, at the center in collaboration with many other institutional colleagues uh, at Kafoskari and beyond. And um, before I introduce you to the three speakers, just to let you know, as always, we do uh, a recording and you uh, should be able to uh, get back to the presentations in a couple of days, depending on the workload of our students, who I'm very grateful uh, for um, um, taking care of dissemination and uh, post-processing of all the information related to our uh, seminar series. Um, that's it as for the practicalities. Uh, so we have three speakers. So the first speaker is our dear Elisa Kolo, a research uh, facilitator at the VDPH. And what that means is uh, hard to put in words. So uh, she's taking care of management and communication and is really indispensable for keeping uh, research and training activities running at our center. Uh, but she is at the same time uh, a researcher in her own right. So and holds a PhD in ancient history and archeology. span heavily engaged in uh, digital and cultural heritage research and uh, uh, projects, specialized in public engagement, cit citizen science, and uh, collaboration with public and private companies. And more recently, uh, uh, she's focusing on neuroscientific approaches to archeology span and cultural heritage in general. And that's also what, uh, is, uh, what's the topic of uh, the talk today. Uh, Medio Danelon is, uh, uh, until very recently, has been uh, a visiting a scholar at uh, University Kafoskari here in Venice at our center, with a strong expertise in architectural and virtual environment modeling. He holds a PhD in Oriental Studies and began his academic journey with an MA in Ancient History uh, from the University of Pisa. He worked as a postdoc at Duke University, uh, US, and uh, is specialized in analyzing and visualizing cultural heritage and archaeological data. And as a core member of the Digital Archaeology uh, Laboratory, led by uh, Maurizio Forto, who has been presenting in our series already a year ago or two years ago, and will be back for our summer school uh, in July. Uh, Nebio is doing excavations across Italy, uh, Turkey, and uh, Greece. Uh, he uh, collaborates with various university and diverse projects uh, and is currently a research fellow at La Sapienza. Uh, Federico Boschetti holds two PhDs, uh, one Cototel in classical philology, University of Trento and uh, Lille 3, uh, and a PhD in brain and cognitive sciences, language interaction and computation, uh, uh, again from University of Trento. Uh, since 2011, he has been a researcher at the Centro uh, Nazionale delle Ricerche, a CNR, uh, and uh, more specifically the ELG, so Institute for Computational Linguistics, uh, Antonio Zampoli, and is uh, coordinating the COFIL lab. And uh, since the very beginning of the VDPH, uh, uh, he has been um, uh, um, uh, assigned to the GNR ELG um, research unit at our center and has a, a central role here in supporting and doing uh, research and training. And it's so wide and, uh, uh, and uh, productivity is so high and uh, the collaboration are so numerous, so it's hard to put uh, into a brief introduction. Uh, so he says he's simply interested in collaborative and cooperative philology. Uh, I just want to mention two things. So he has developed and maintains the Euporia platform, so a tool that is widely used by traditionally trained experts and that is based on domain-specific languages uh, to create structured and content-rich humanities data. Uh, and the other thing is uh, that uh, uh, Federico and I together, we are uh, um, directing the Clarin Knowledge Center 
which takes part in the Italian and European uh, clearing research infrastructure uh, dedicated to digital and public uh, textual scholarship. So again, a very productive collaboration between CNR and Capostel. So enough, uh, there uh, would be much more to say uh, about the three of our speakers. And uh, today uh, they give a prime example of how uh, collaboration across the disciplines is uh, carried out here at our center. And the topic of uh, your presentation is heritage in the cognitive age. So where are the slides? There you go. Uh, good afternoon. And uh, with this presentation, uh, we would like to highlight the dialogue across uh, disciplinary boundaries in the landscape of digital and public humanities and also highlight the implication of digital technologies in the pres preservation, in the management and also in the enhancement of a cultural heritage. So in the past few years, uh, most of our projects started in Venice or nearby Venice in the countryside but I mean, a city uh, strictly connected with environmental changes. So our, our work experience uh, um, started to describe the relationship uh, that people have with their own cultural heritage and also the relationship um, to describe, sorry, the way uh, people identify themselves with the environment, with their traditions uh, and with their values. So the next step was to I was to, well, was promoting uh, the engagement of society in participatory ways uh, with the principles of heritage education and uh, in order to find new ways to create a dialogue, uh, a cohesion and also a sustainable development. So we started to engage groups of people in uh, common activities uh, represented by a common interest and uh, as a way to find their, let me say, affinity place and letting them find their space and their identity. And in this sense, we started to, to use a new romanistic approach uh, that is an approach uh, to, that integrates insights from neurosciences with the humanities to better understand human experience and behavior. And for me, uh, a way to explore um, the influence of culture in, on human consciousness. So um, in, in this way, it is possible to study the real involvement of people, for instance, uh, for instance, in archaeological sites, and see how much people are directly connected with the cultural and environmental context. So, uh, this is the archaeological site of Sant'Ilario in Mira, nearby Venice. Um, an, an excavation supervised by Professor Stavro Gelichi and Professor Alessandro Alessio Rucco, that is here online. Hello, Alessandro. Good afternoon. Um, Sant'Ilario is an ancient monastery, um, one of the ancient religious institutions of early medieval Venice, known as the site of many ducal burials. So uh, the study is revealing extreme uh, anthropogenic changes over the centuries in order to maintain a strategic position uh, in the river network. So the current landscape represents the result uh, on which these changes can be read, can be perceived, and also can be expressed by the inhabitant, inhabitants themselves. So this site is a kind, was a kind of test bench for our neuro humanities activities and so beyond uh, beyond the, the excavation in practice we are the activities we are planning for the next campaign um, aim to fill the gap of awareness uh, expressed by the, the the present society and also we are working with with students young students and kids in order to to find uh, to create uh, a, a new future for this site. We also tested uh, eye tracking uh, um, capturing technique uh, in combination with BTS. It is a teaching method for uh, to enhance critical thinking and with the use of questions, okay? So, Thanks, first of, first of all, of uh, the support of Professor Vincenzo Ferrara, 
from Sapienza University of Rome. She is an expert in art as a tool for learning in school and uh, in medical education. And thanks also to the work of Grazia Solenne, our first uh, graduate in neurohumanities, uh, thanks to the supervision of Professor uh, Federico Bernardini. So all these activities, all these experiences could be a valid solution for creating innovative programs, okay, to engage communities, uh, individuals, and also professionals. Oh, he's here. <laughs> uh, professionals with culture. So these tools offer also employment uh, um, opportunities, as the case of Grazia, and provide new research options for, for students. To, oh, sorry. to conclude, uh, I would like to show you our, our actual partnerships, uh, starting from Duke University with the project Neuro Artifact, uh, a project uh, in neuroarchaeology uh, with the supervision of uh, Professor Maurizio Forte, a full professor of classical visual studies uh, at Duke, uh, a project that aims to break new ground uh, in the study of the past in between uh, um, ancient and modern mind by approaching research questions at the intersection of brain sciences and also humanities, etc. So, um, and also the Neurocities and Ruinscapes, uh, another project that aims to reconstruct uh, ancient cities and ruins using VR. Uh, I would also I would like to uh, highlight also our participations in the in the VDPH exchange program with the Center for Te Textual and Spatial Analysis uh, started in 2023 uh, in the light of the Global Horizon for the Digital and Public Humanities uh, Research Institute. So. Um, we, uh, together with Stanford University, of course, but la and last but not least. Um, all right, let me introduce our lab, uh, thanks to our director, Franz Fischer. Now we have uh, a viable standard instrument uh, for digitization, data processing, and analysis of text, images, uh, images, and docs in order to facilitate the research in digital uh, humanities in general, and also uh, customized instruments in order to be innovative for experimental teaching, for instance, and exchange. And regarding neuro humanities, we have also uh, our uh, emotive inside, our brain sensor, uh, our eye tracker, uh, pupil invisible, and uh, HP headset with electroencephalography included. Uh, so, uh, 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 and last but not least, our amazing 3D printer <laughs> this year, <laughs> our diabolic 3D printer. So, that's all for the moment. And uh, I leave the floor to my colleagues, Clavio. Thank you. Hello. So we engaged in a variety of projects that adopted uh, advanced technologies taken from the field of neurosciences. Specifically, we experimented with just electroencephalography, EEG, and eye tracking system. These technologies enabled us to gather valuable data on human cognitive and perceptual processes. Is there oh, yeah. Okay. Back. Uh, so I'm going to show uh, some of these projects we uh, carried out here. And uh, specifically, uh, we start with the first. Oh, come on. Okay. Uh, in one of our initial experiments, we tested an EEG device, Emotive Insight, in combination with a VR headset, Oculus Quest, to observe subject emotional reaction to changing ambient conditions by simulating day, evening, and night scenarios. Specifically, we aimed to determine whether different lighting condition could impact the emotional perception of urban landscapes. We developed a 3D visual uh, scenario using Unity software, featuring three iconic cities, Mamluk Cairo, Timurid Samarkand, and Khmer Angkor, 
To enhance engagement, we created narratives that allowed participants to explore and interact with object and detail architecture. The test was conducted under three different lighting conditions, as I said, daylight, sunset, and moonlight. Uh, the experiment presented challenges, particularly in maintaining consistent uh, starting condition for each participant. Despite these difficulties, we were able to identify some trends. A greater intensity of beta waves, characteristic of the condition of wakefulness and concentration in the diurnal scenario. A prevalence of alpha waves, characteristic uh, of the condition of relaxation prior to falling asleep in the nocturnal scenario. And the prevalence of alpha waves, characteristic of the condition of relaxation prior to, uh, again, to failing, um, falling asleep in the nocturnal scenario. So, um, in this other experiment, we tested the pupil invisible eye tracker on several cultural heritage sites in Venice. Eye tracking is the process of measuring either the point of gaze where one is looking at, or the motion of an eye relative to the head. Eye trackers are used in research on the visual system, in psychology, and psycholinguistic marketing as an input device for human computer interaction and in product design. Our experiment focused on the, statu uh, the statues of lions in Venice Arsenal, with particular attention to the so called Piraeus lion. The statue, located at the main entrance uh, to the arsenal, is notable for uh, its three runic inscription made by Varangian mercenaries in the second half of the 11th century AD. These inscriptions are now heavily eroded due to weathering and air pollution. We observed that participants who were informed about the history of the statue and the presence of the inscription actively attempted to locate it despite its uh, reduced visibility. In contrast, participants who were not informed about the inscription either missed it uh, entirely or look around in other direction without focus. Uh, in a derived project had held at Duke University, we created a digital replica of the lion sculpture using photogrammetry. To use it within a VR headset equipped with the eye tracking technology. In this case, we were also able to track and map pupil movement on the 3D surface of the lion to understand which areas of the model attracted the most attention. So actually, as you can see here, you are uh, actually able to paint uh, with your sight the, the, the texture, so the image um, the, the, the skin of this uh, model. And this is uh, particularly interesting because uh, we can follow also the, um, the direction of the site. So uh, the last project I'm going to show here uh, um, is a part of a research conducted in collaboration with Elisa Corral, research facilitator at GTPH, Maurizio Forte, professor of classical studies, art history, visual studies, at Duke University, Vincenza Ferrara, Director of Laboratory of Art and Medical Humanities at the Faculty of Pharmacy and Medicine at the Sapienza University in Rome. Here we presented the results of a study in the field of neurohumanities conducted as a part of the broader Neuro Cities and Ruinscapes project at Duke University in collaboration with the Venice Center of Digital and Public Humanities. This research explores the application of new technologies for cognitive monitoring within the context of cultural heritage and historical urban complexes. Specifically, we focus on comparing the views of monuments in Rome, such as Nerva Medica Temple in Pyramide Cestia, as depicted by Piranesi within their current state. We employed a neurohumanistic approach because the development of neuroscience today allows us to conduct quantitative studies on complex cognitive processes 
even in a specific observation context related to arts and literature. There are studies demonstrating how these, uh, the use of cupilometry in conjunction with uh, visual thinking strategies enables the analysis of activities, both behavioral and emotional, providing deeper insights into how individuals engage with and interpret visual and art works. Uh, the combination of optometric techniques and visual thinking strategies, a transdisciplinary tool, helped enhance critical thinking and observational skills, avoiding influencing responses. We observed a distinction in how expert and non-expert engage with monuments and the diverse perspectives through which archaeological sites are perceived, enriching our understanding and facilitating more inclusive interpretations for all audiences. In response to the question, what do you see inserted into a questionnaire created within the visual thinking method, specifically <laughs> regarding spontaneous narrative about a known or unknown monument, Two categories of response were identified. The first, taxonomic descriptive, and the second, didactic interpretative. While expert provided taxonomic description focused on details, non-expert offered interpretative engagement with descriptive narratives and visually evocative imagery, imagery reflecting personal connection and memories, showcasing the immense potential of these approaches. For example, archaeologists or industry experts tend to give a categorical interpretation, dating, style, context of the monument. In short, they no longer see the artifact, but determine it without particular emphasis. Non-archaeologists and occasional visitors, on the other hand, focus on a more metaphorical, elusive, and evocative narrative. For the former, the pyramid is a classified archaeological site. For the latter, it is an open form placed in a dichotomous urban context that partially confuses and embraces the sea. In short, specialized minds seems to work more on the foreground, the site, the classified artifacts, while most visitors have a more focused mind on the background, the scenario, the description of forms, the monument as a stage. All this data will then be correlated with qualitative and quantitative statistics based on biometric data, such as eye tracking. Certainly to our eyes, it seems very promising and interesting finding. Uh, so I leave the floor to Federica now for the last part of the. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we shift uh, our attention from uh, the material cultural heritage to the immaterial uh, uh, cultural heritage, such as uh, text and uh, language. Okay, uh, as uh, for uh, computational and digital uh, philology, uh, we have uh, uh, many methods and tools also that have been developed previously for uh, uh, computational linguistics and in the case of this new discipline that is uh, neurophilology uh, by uh, neurolinguistics. So first of all, what is uh, neurolinguistics? Neurolinguistics is the interdisciplinary field that studies how language is acquired, represented, and processed in the brain. In particular, it is focused on uh, uh, the broadcast area that, uh, involved, that is involved in language production and articulation, and the invernic area that is essential for language uh, comprehension. Uh, neurolinguistics uh, is uh, particularly useful uh, for uh, study of uh, impairments. Okay, so uh, there's uh, also a medical approach to that uh, that naturally we haven't uh, in uh, neurophilology. Uh, so the neurophilology 
is an emerging interdisciplinary field that merges neuroscience and philology to explore how the brain processes, comprehends and generates language, particularly focusing on textual transmission and error generation. By integrating neuroimaging techniques, cognitive psychology and textual analysis, neurophilology seeks to understand the cognitive and neural mechanisms that underpin the copying, transmission, and the evolution of texts over time. There's, uh, the, the, there's uh, a, a particular study that I like a lot by Sebastiano Timpanaro, okay, because uh, he, uh, in the, the, during the 60s, okay, uh, claimed, okay, and uh, claimed that, that uh, a psychoanalytical approach to philology is not so correct because uh, there's uh, no an empirical and systematic uh, uh, settlement of that, okay? So Kimpanaro highlights the role of cognitive processes such as memory, attention, mental fatigue in production of speech errors. For instance, he points out that uh, the interference from the recently used words also, okay? So an approach that is quantitative, he calls for more empirical and systematic study of speech errors through data collection and analysis of word frequency and the context of different types of uh, lapsus, lapse of tongue. Okay. And uh, in recent years, as uh, you can see, there are other cognitive uh, approaches that involve also the uh, relation with uh, uh, artificial uh, intelligence. But uh, what, what means to uh, have uh, an experimental setting and experimental setup in uh, uh, philology, okay, in particular neurophilology. It means uh, to have a controlled environment, okay, to uh, limit the, the variables, okay, to have uh, qualified participants, to have uh, plausible materials also, okay, that uh, uh, will be, uh, of course, uh, modern, okay, but uh, that uh, can be compatible with uh, the study of the past. Procedures that are compliant to protocol for uh, the uh, re reproducibility, okay, the, the replicability of uh, the experiments and uh, the identification of uh, the variables under observation, the collection of data by instruments, particularly we will see by eye trackers, uh, and also we can use uh, the, the EG, okay, as uh, we will see in a few minutes, uh, and uh, naturally to take into account also the ethical issues. For example, if uh, we want to generate errors, we must uh, have the people that uh, are under stress, for example, okay, but uh, we must take into account also naturally the uh, ethical implications of uh, these uh, um, challenging conditions, okay? So the eye tracker, I, I will add some uh, some uh, information to what uh, my colleagues have uh, said, okay? So uh, what, uh, what is an eye tracker? It measures the eye movements because it tracks where a person is looking. So the gaze point records the sequence of eye movements, the saccades, and monitors the duration of gaze at specific points, the fixations. It analyzes the attention because it determines what visual information is capturing attention. It measures how long attention is held in various elements and assesses how attention shifts over time. And then it evaluates visual search patterns, studies how individuals search for information in the visual field, identifies common search strategies and patterns, and is useful for interface design and usability testing. Uh, finally, there's uh, also this uh, cognitive load assessment to estimate mental effort based on eye movement patterns to identify areas of high cognitive load by analyzing gaze behavior and to assist in optimizing tasks to reduce the cognitive strain. As you can see here, there are many different types 
of uh, eye trackers, okay, that are uh, uh, more precise and less precise eye trackers, but the more precise one, unfortunately, are usually usually are fixed, okay? So you, you cannot move with them because uh, you must be constrained, okay, uh, with the fixation point uh, by creating a, an irrealistic situation, okay? On the contrary, if you have a mobile one, we can, uh, uh, we can capture uh, the, the, the data uh, in a, a more realistic environment, okay? Uh, in uh, the past, uh, we made uh, a small experiment uh, on uh, uh, OCR correction with uh, uh, the monitoring uh, by the eye tracker. Why? Because uh, we asked to some uh, students to uh, correct uh, the errors, and we had uh, a target group, okay, that uh, was skilled that knows which kind of errors uh, had to expect, and another group that on the control, on the, on the contrary, okay, so the control group that on the contrary uh, was, uh, how can I say, naive, okay, uh, they didn't know which kind of errors to expect. So uh, we realized that, that uh, people that uh, knew which kind of errors to expect, okay, in that, uh, in that experiment, uh, the, 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 the errors uh, were created by us, okay? So for example, uh, Rn instead of M, okay? Because they are very similar uh, and a uh, few other cases. So we, uh, we verified that people that doesn't know how to correct it, uh, move the eyes continuously from uh, the uh, original uh, to the to the copy, okay, and on the contrary, people uh, that uh, that uh, know it, okay, just uh, put glance, okay, on the uh, suspected uh, uh, words uh, with a possible error, okay. So different modalities, different. Uh, ways to approach the error correction in this case. Uh, here uh, you see uh, the emotive again, okay, and uh, as uh, uh, Nelio said, uh, okay, uh, with this uh, simple uh, kind of uh, EEG, it has just five electrodes, okay, you co compared to the complex one that can have uh, more than 95 uh, electrodes, for example, all around the skull, okay. Uh, but uh, even with this uh, uh, simple uh, type uh, of uh, EEG, uh, we can uh, capture, okay, some brain activities and in particular uh, activities that are uh, related to that. <laughs> Connected with these uh, kind of states of mind. Okay, so for example, relaxation, stress, focus, uh, excitement, okay, that uh, are involved also in uh, the coping uh, processes, okay, in particular, boldness. Anyway, <laughs> anyway. Uh, you, you, you can see that by EG is possible also to uh, study, okay, to monitor the attention. The attention is the cognitive process of selectively focusing on specific stimuli while ignoring the others, okay? And the EG can track attentional fluctuations and help understand how lapses in attention contribute to the error generation. Finally, okay, Another aspect that is uh, very interesting is uh, the study of the short uh, term memory that is uh, involved in uh, the coping uh, process. So the, the short term memory is crucial in the generation of errors because the scribe needs to memorize pericopies that are the textual chunks from the antigraph to the autograph. 
specific experiments can be prepared to study the STM in the context of error generation. And uh, uh, I, I finished, uh, and uh, if you want, we can discuss a little bit uh, how, uh, in particular, how uh, a, a, an experimental setup can be really useful or not to study something that is so so uh, far from uh, our time. Okay. Thank you very much uh, to the three speakers. Uh, we have no time for a discussion also among the three of you, if you like. <laughs> Okay, I will bring the, the yes, that's yeah. nice. Thank you, Mr. Tonya. So, thank you for this presentation. Uh, as you know, I appreciate your project and all the implication, especially in the museographical, museological fields, environment. And it is my question, so uh, mainly related to follow-up project, follow-up representation of also application of these uh, techniques uh, of a uh, tracking and uh, um, related to the um, reading of maybe ancient or modern sculpture in the museum context, how um, both user and visitors and the curator would and would benefit from the application by the application of these uh, techniques and uh, um, which kind of data would you need to um, um, interrogate also or uh, integrate or access to in order to implement and make this final model visualization much more effective both for an, an um, involvement and engaging purposes but also for scholar purposes okay thank you uh, answer so yeah in multiple ways i would say uh, there's an example i can cite which is a neural artifact so in that context some artifacts uh, from the museum of villa giulia in rome so Tuscan artifacts were uh, digitized in 3d and then we used these uh, 3d models they used these 3d models in order to uh, create a scenario where to test this kind of uh, um, say instruments and uh, in one case i remember uh, there was the pediment of a temple a Tuscan temple uh, with a particular representation of the myth of the seven against Thebes, this uh, Greek myth. And so these um, figures were arranged, uh, say, artistically. Uh, it's a very beautiful piece. And uh, so uh, the observer was um, told to look freely. Uh, and uh, the narrative, the myth, was narrated. Uh, in the same moment. So we were able, for instance, to uh, assess if the narrative was good or not, because in some ways, if they were looking uh, somewhere else, not on focusing on the, the main character, Athena and other heroes of the myth, and uh, or, or they were um, focused on the right place. So this is, uh, it could be a possible tool to assess if a uh, narrative is good or not for visitors in general. This is just an example, but I think uh, another, uh, also the arrangement uh, in the museum of these items is also important and you can test it using eye tracking as something is visible, is given the, the right importance uh, in the space of the museum or not. So there's uh, plenty, I think, of uh, uh, opportunities. We are just in the beginning, so these technologies uh, for sure in the next year will provide uh, some help understand yeah, in the, uh, these issues, so geography. And, and also game designing, maybe. <laughs> absolutely, yes. <laughs> Definitely. 
Yes, we are in the beginning, but we have a lot of ideas, Stefania, and we would like you to start to 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 try to to go on and to create something in this direction. Also, because we we are really uh, convinced about the fact that this kind of technologies and also this kind of dissemination and new can create a new kind of narration also for uh, find new ways to 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 to, for, to create to create dissemination i mean so also for students and uh, it's a new kind to it's a way to co-produce knowledge also so new knowledge so this could be um a valid point thank you questions so I have a question because so, I mean it's really impressive and really new and you really uh, pioneers here applying this to humanities, to my knowledge, <laughs> uh, to my limited knowledge. Um, so at the moment you are so Federico mentioned a little bit the weaknesses of the tools where they are not precise and uh, the empirical data is not uh, uh, sound enough so to find arrangements. Uh, to uh, make this valuable research. Um, and one way is to look what you know. So you, you don't find things you don't expect. So in order to, to adjust the tools and make the fine granular uh, adjustments of, of your measurements, for example. Um, so that's one way. So also that's always how I perceived distant reading, for example, or many linguistic tools uh, that you don't really get new knowledge, but you see what you would expect, and then you see, oh, there's a difference from my expectation. Then you look closer, and then you either adjust the algorithm, the tool, or you really discover something new, and then you have to find some explanation for this. So uh, I think what we have seen, so if you look then more closely where the line, for example, has the inscription. It's something I would expect. So of course, if you're informed, you're looking, can I see it? So that's nothing uh, surprising, but it's nice you can see, you can show that it's actually the case. So you create uh, uh, proofs for, for your hypothesis, even if simple, but that's, that's the starting point. But in your research and with the various uh, applications that you already uh, worked out, uh, did you uh, encounter also surprising results where you think, oh, that's really something uh, I can't explain immediately, or maybe it's the tool is just not good enough, or is there already something that shows or here's potential to explain things or to discover things that otherwise you would have not discovered or were not able to explain? So in, in this, the three, regards the four of you, uh, three of you, if you had such surprising results where you really were then questions as a researcher, so what, what do I do with that? I am uh, very interested uh, in uh, uh, the uh, relation between uh, syntactic and semantic uh, complexity, uh, visualizing the page, okay, so the eye movement on the page, uh, in connection with uh, this uh, uh, syntactic and semantic uh, uh, complexity, okay, and uh, error generation. Because uh, uh, the hypothesis, uh, okay, is uh, that, uh, is uh, that uh, when uh, you have uh, something that is unexpected, okay, like uh, complex, uh, uh, sentence, uh, you must uh, move uh, back and forth uh, your eyes on the page, and uh, this potentially generate uh, more errors, okay? So... Uh, yeah, we know this as an eye skip, for example, so the technical terms to explain exactly these kind of errors, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, to have the possibility to uh, have some experimental uh, data, I guess that is uh, interesting because uh, uh, from uh, from a philological point of view, okay, is uh, is an hypothesis, is a good hypothesis, I guess, okay. But uh, if we have the support also of uh, data, could be better, okay. Uh, the uh, instruments that we have 
probably are not uh, completely uh, precise to capture these uh, these uh, subtleties, okay. But uh, if uh, we uh, are able, okay, to gather the first data, even if uh, the, the, the the instrument have not uh, this uh, big uh, precision, then uh, we could uh, search for uh, other groups uh, that collaborate and work uh, in the same direction that uh, can uh, that can uh, 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 Borrow, yeah, lend the, 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 uh, their uh, instruments that maybe are more precise, and uh, so to 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 overcome uh, the obstacle of technology. Uh, also, in the case uh, of uh, EG, as I said, this is a very simple, very limited. Uh, uh, instrument okay but uh, uh, we have uh, the possibility to use it uh, also for hours okay and uh, this is uh, an advantage okay and uh, so i guess that uh, we can uh, we can uh, make the first experiments and then to try to make them go up uh, for sure uh, uh, the first step is uh, to test something that is uh, trivial, that is uh, that is an, that is not a surprise, okay. But uh, in a second phase, if this test uh, works, then we can try something more complex, okay. For example, uh, uh, by studying the interaction between syntactic and semantic uh, uh, complexity, okay, because it is obvious that uh, if you must copy, okay, a chunk uh, of text that is very simple, okay, uh, li like a simple tale, okay, you just uh, uh, capture in your memory, in your short memory, a chunk, and then you are able to, to go back uh, and uh, with precise position uh, of uh, the other chunk and so on. But uh, if uh, uh, the if uh, the, the, the sentence is complex, uh, also the division in chunks uh, can be more difficult uh, and so uh, more challenging to find the back the the, the, the good position uh, and, and so on. Okay. Question Grazia, that is online. Oh, you think that we have to together? <laughs> oh, yeah. Grazia, are you online? Yes. Yes, okay. I'm online. Thank you. So, I think that it, it is an important time now for communication about cultural heritage. So, may I ask you your experience, your point of view in during your works uh, in Mira and in Rome? So, let us know. Yes, like in terms of communication in general, like uh, in particular the um, experiment uh, in Mira, uh, like the BTS, uh, but also um, like the, um, sorry, one second that I have to, uh, the BTS experience, but then also the one that we did uh, during the visits, um, we had the opportunity with a lot, of, a lot of people of the community and also um, like uh, the forms uh, um, that were part also of my analysis, uh, like really highlighted the, the importance uh, of communicating heritage to the community. Um, and I think that like this is a point uh, to like value and to work on a lot. Um, in general, like um, the experience considering also um, like the uh, I try to like sum up uh, in my thesis, uh, um, like really evidenced uh, the importance to also open, uh, to create open activities uh, and to involve community in an active way as a way to communicate with community heritage. I don't know, like if I uh, un, like reply to your answer, yeah. but. <laughs> Do you have a question there? Or... Do you have a questions for the audience? 
or do we have questions to the audience or <laughs> you are really a public engagement person? It's wonderful. We have been to have this so far. <laughs> More question, otherwise. Well, Jin said, do you have a question or just put Hello, Vincenza, thank you very much. We can't hear you. If you want to say something, you are very welcome. Ah, yeah, here you go. Hello. <laughs> it's very interesting, uh, your presentation. Um, I collaborated to this work uh, and uh, I um, yesterday I application BTS with uh, a medicine student from Missouri uh, in Rome in front of Palatino <laughs> archaeological landscape and um, uh, with the, the form of BTS the same uh, experience. Uh, it is was very interesting because uh, um, uh, also that, uh, that those students uh, like uh, this opportunity to observe, to reflect our observation, uh, to share their observation, uh, their hypothesis with the other or the group and discussion the group uh, and uh, I think uh, this uh, uh, BTS, but not also with BTS, also the, the uh, opportunity to, um, to evaluate through instrument, uh, the perception, eye tracking, and eye tracking is very different. As you say, uh, when you see, but uh, uh, all, uh, you see, and different from you, um, uh, try to ask her what's going on in this uh, place, this picture, because as you say, uh, the brain uh, gone on. Uh, and so it's very interesting, the, uh, um, the, the, the answers, and, uh, and also uh, the work of, uh, in the group is very important and th these studies uh, can be very useful for archaeology study but also uh, important uh, studies on the cognitive of people and as the cultural heritage for my opinion but not <laughs> for my opinion is to very good for improve well-being for the people but also improve uh, life skills are uh, very important to to quality of life and uh, to know the the uh, our history and uh, our ancient history because it's the way that I can learning more better Thank you very much. Um, if there are no further questions, I think uh, we deserve an aperitivo so that the rain, <laughs> you know, that the rain stops, uh, fortunately, so that climate change is in full action. Uh, lots of rainy days here in Venice uh, and sunshine in, in, in Germany. Um, yeah, thank you very much once again to this. <laughs>